Turn in your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 8. As we go through the Acts of the Holy Spirit in the church, which was what would be a good title for the book of Acts. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. We see the uh, pattern, if you will, or the character of God being poured out into common people so that they can go out and tell others about Christ. They can be the evangelists that they were called to be or do the work of the ministry that they were called to do. And if you'll remember with me, really, I mean, we see that Christ told the disciples in Acts 1.8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses for me throughout Jerusalem, uh, all of Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And he told them to go wait in the upper room, and they go wait, and the church is birthed there in Acts chapter 2. And then they share the gospel there in Jerusalem. They get arrested, and really the, the, the other commandments, so you can't do part of God's will and leave out the rest of his commands. His first commandment was to go. He said, wait, let me give you power, and now go. And they continued to hunker down and hang out, and God added to the numbers there in Jerusalem, and, and it became necessary that they assign some deacons because, because there were some problems with the Greek-speaking uh, uh, Jews or the Hellenists. And so they assigned these deacons so that they could continue in the Word of God and in prayer and stay focused on equipping everybody else that was coming in. And if you'll remember, then we see Stephen and Philip as two of the seven, and we get their testimony. Stephen becomes the first martyr. And now in chapter 8, we have Philip, who has went down to Samaria. But why did he go down there? Oh, la, 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 I'm going to go down to Samaria. No, because they hunkered down in Jerusalem, and they were not obeying what God had told them to do, to go. God allowed persecution to come, and he used the persecution to spread them. To move them. And that's what happens a lot of times. That when, when you get in a sharp disagreement with somebody, we will see Paul and Barnabas. And it creates two ministry teams. God uses our fickleness and all things for his good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. So the reason he goes to Samaria is quite simply because he didn't want to get killed in Jerusalem or thrown in jail. And he goes down there and he reaps this great harvest where Jesus had shared in Samaria in John chapter 4 with the Samaritan woman by the well. And he goes down there and they're waiting to hear the truth more fully. And then everybody's getting saved. Even Simon the sorcerer we seen last week who formally practiced sorcery. I think it's very, previously I think is what it says in 8-9. Uh, previously practiced sorcery and he gets saved just like everybody else the words are the same and then he continued with philip what an amazing story that the gospel is for everybody there's nowhere you can go that god can't reach you and that's what the the, the gospel of according to luke in the book of acts fifth gospel sometimes it's called is wanting to show us and reveal to us is the love of God that re reaches everywhere. It's not just for some elect. It's a whomsoever gospel. In fact, we see that in, in, in chapter 8 here, today's text, the eunuch that we're going to encounter is from the family of Ham. And then next week, we're going to see Paul, who's from the family of Shem. And then the following week in chapter 10, if we get there sometime this year, we're going to see Cornelius, who's from Japheth's family. And so we're seeing that the gospel goes to every single person after God commanded Noah to repopulate the earth, and he had his sons with him, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And we see every person, every, every culture, everybody reached with the gospel. In fact, Acts chapter 2, the church is birthed with all Jews. Now we're in Samaria, and they're half Jewish, half Assyrian. In chapter 10, we're going to go into the uttermost parts of the world to Cornelius, who's all Gentile. See, and so the gospel, God wants us to see clearly 
It's not just, he's not given every detail of every person who's ever saved, but he wants us to understand that it's a whomsoever gospel, that it's for every nation, every tongue, it's for every class, it's for every place. It's, it doesn't matter who you are. If you were born of woman of water, you need to be reborn of God in the spirit. And he wants us to understand that we can place our lives in these pages and come to salvation no matter who we are. But we must come. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me. For I am humble and lowly of heart, and my burden is easy and my yoke is light. Christ will do the work, but we must choose to come. We must choose to come. So as we close last week, we see that um, Peter and John, who had come down, they left, and they were preaching the word of the Lord as they returned to Jerusalem. They preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And so you see barriers being torn down also. What's the barriers come down? Listen, listen, Jewish people didn't even want to go into Samaria. They would go around it. In Christ, they are reaching out to anybody. There's no racism in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek nor white nor black nor skinny nor free, male or female. In the spiritual realm, we are all equal. In God's eyes, we're all equal. At the cross, there's no raised platform. There's no stage. Only Christ is high and lifted up. Only Christ has been lifted up out of the grave. Only Christ has been lifted up into heaven and ascended. He's the one we must lift up. The gospel is for everyone. So revival has broke out in Samaria as the guys go down there, lay hands on and people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then as they leave, they're rejoicing and they preach. They caruso. They heralded good news to all the other villages as they returned. Same way they had seen their teacher Jesus doing it. And then verse 26 of chapter 8 in the book of Acts. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I understand unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus... Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Astois, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Let's pray. Father, a testimony of your obedient servant under the power of your spirit surrendered to you as a vessel of honor. And we ask that 
that would be our testimony. We ask that you would remove anything in us that would cause us not to desire to be obedient to your call upon our lives. And that we would be those who would share the gospel with the people we meet. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Acts 8.26, again, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Now you have to really get an understanding here of where he's at, what's going on, because this is something that doesn't happen in the church today. I'm not picking on God's bride, but here is a young man who was serving tables, working in the food bank, talking about Jesus. He had a good reputation in the community, and he was full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom. And persecution breaks out, and he heads to Samaria. Maybe he joined a caravan. We don't know how he got there, what made him go to that specific area. But he gets there and revival breaks out. Everybody's getting saved. Even a sorcerer gets saved. Think about this for a minute. And while everybody's getting saved, and, and, and maybe thousands, we're not given the numbers, and it's not about numbers. It's about each individual soul. You don't get anything out of this text. Really get that. Because a faithful servant to God is told by an angel, go. Whoa, 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 Lord. It, it can't be you, Lord, because revival's breaking out. Who's going to take care of these people here? You can't send the senior pastor away. See, it would look like Philip is kind of, he's an evangelist, we're told in 21.8, but it would look like he's kind of like the senior pastor. We're going to see it again when Paul and Barnabas are separated by the Holy Spirit from the church to go on missionary journeys. See, we do it upside down in the world today. We send out the new converts to go plant other places instead of sending out the pastors and the senior pastors who already have been tested, who already know how to battle, who already know how to fight. Philip is asked to lead. So that God gets the glory for the work. God is the one doing the work in Samaria. But when he stays there, then he becomes the rock star and it looks like he's doing the work. <clears throat> See, you don't need anybody but the Holy Spirit there and a willing vessel to do the work of the ministry in the church today. And it's so important that we understand that because we often get the understanding like the eunuch has here that it's a man that gives him understanding. How can I? He says, you understand? We're going to get there in a minute. You understand what you're reading? How can I, unless this is the King James, unless a man leads me? That's wrong. It's the Holy Spirit that leads us, not a man. God uses men, but we don't want to get our eyes on the physical, temporal. We want to keep our eyes fixed on the heavenly place, the spiritual, the eternal I'm a little ahead of myself. And Paul does say, follow me while I follow Christ. But listen, the focus is always following Christ. It wasn't following Paul. The focus was on following Christ and the work of his spirit and letting him build his church in your heart. So, Philip doesn't argue. Notice. Notice, he's told again, go. Go. See, that's the point that God wants to get into his people. Go to other souls. Go to others and tell them this good news. If you haven't, go. Persecution came and he made them go. Now he's beginning to listen. He's learning. Now he says go. No instruction. Look, go into this general area. That's what it says there. Look. He doesn't tell him, go and there's going to be an Ethiopian eunuch and he's going to be uh, down the road with a bunch of uh, other people and he's going to be coming from. He just says, go toward general area, south along the road, which goes down towards Jerusalem and Gaza. And he's got this holy appointment for him. He's got this appointment of one soul. 
leaves thousands of people maybe that need to be discipled. Listen, Paul says it later to the Ephesian elders. He commends them to the Holy Spirit. He doesn't commend them to a man that's there that looks like he's rising above the rest. He commends them to the Holy Spirit and the work of God in their hearts. And at the end of the day, listen, 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 listen. All of discipleship has to begin and end with coming to Jesus and learning from him. He will use men and other women. He will use obedient vessels, but it has to be always and forever coming to him because that's what it's all about. Adam and Eve walked with him in the garden in perfect fellowship. And the devil interrupted that with a lie. And Eve was deceived. And Adam went willingly in toward his wife instead of being deceived. He went against the authority of God willingly. And then God was always working out this plan of salvation to bring us back into his authority. To bring us back into perfect fellowship with him. Yes, we do it with the body of Christ. Yes, iron sharpens iron. Yes, he chips away at us as we hang out together. And we must have that as an essential part. But do not miss that you have to come in boldly to the throne room to obtain mercy and find grace to help in all times, times of need. You'll already be prepared. So it has to be always and forever being coming to the work of the Holy Spirit, coming to Christ, being discipled by Christ. And here again, get ahead of myself. I like to do that. Just don't want to be ahead of the Holy Spirit. Um, as long as I get ahead of myself, I'm fine. The underlying theme is obedience. Not a bunch of questions, just obedience. Go! Go! Persecution comes because they weren't being obedient to go. They were sharing. They were hunkering down in their own little bless me clubs. And God, who loves them and wants to perfect them, allows these things to come so that they will be obedient. Because what is the part? What is the point here? To be like Christ. What was he obedient in everything? Even to the point of death on a cross. So if we're being made like Christ. We were disobedient, born dead, born going to the grave, not even knowing it. We're delivered into salvation, into becoming like Christ. Now, our hearts are supposed to be looking to be obedient. What's the next thing to do to be obedient to God? What's the next thing I'm doing? Not in works, because you know what? You're faithless, and I'm faithless. You know what? You're unfaithful, and I'm unfaithful. You know what? You're a sinner, and I'm a sinner. But in Christ, we're new creations. And in Christ, he gives us, in his spirit, a gift of faithfulness. It's part of the fruit. And so our hearts are always to look to be learning to be like Christ, who was obedient. In fact, let's get way ahead of ourselves. Look at, look at uh, Hebrews 5. Hebrews 5. Verse 08, just quickly. Though he was a son, speaking of Christ, yet he learned, learned is discipled, learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, wasn't he already perfected? Having been completed, he became the author of eternal salvation to who? To all who obey him. <laughs> See, listen, listen. This is the fruit of salvation, is, is being conformed into the image of Christ. Who was Christ? He was the Son of God who obeyed in all things. So the whole finish line is in you and I learning to obey in the next thing that comes up. Part of obeying is doing what? 1 John 1, 9. We confess. When we sin, we confess. But our hearts are being moved toward a will that we will always obey in the next thing. We'll always obey because the problem of sin is, is we're out of the authority of God. We're not under the authority of God. We are like fools saying no to God. 
And salvation brings us into a place where Christ gave us his perfect obedience, where we say yes and yes and amen and yes. And now in sanctification, he's teaching us to turn our hearts that way, where we always say yes and yes, where we always say what next, Lord, where we're always trying to be obedient in the power of the Spirit. I hope this is clear to you. Because it's something that the church needs to hear. Is that we're moving to Christ's likeness where we're obeying. Not as a work of religion. Not as a work to save us. But as being conformed by the Spirit into the image of the living God. Because He was obedient in all things. And He suffered these things to show us how to be obedient even in the pain. Even in the problems, even in the suffering, no matter what it was, he still obeyed truth because God was already ahead of him waiting. Just like here with the eunuch. Philip is going in his obedience. He finds what God's doing already waiting for him to be done. The Spirit already went. It's prepared the heart of the person. It's prepared everything for him. All he has to do is show up and then open his mouth. All he has to do is show up and open his mouth. Because the work is the work of the Spirit. It's not the work of man. If it's a work of man, we'll be disobedient. If it's a work of man, we'll be unfaithful. If it's your flesh, you're not going to show up. You're going to find something else because your flesh wars against the Spirit. Your flesh is an enemy of God. But when you choose, Lord, I want to have a heart that obeys you. Lord, I want to walk in the Spirit and you begin to move your heart in that direction and you draw near to God, he draws near to you. When you begin to cry out at the throne room for that desire to be conformed into the image of Christ, then he moves you into that image. It's called sanctification. It's the middle of the race. Yes, positionally, you're perfect. You're complete. Positionally, the power of sin is taken care of. The penalty of sin is taken care of. The penalty of what? Disobedience. Disobedience. Sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness is sin. It's all disobedience to God, to his authority. And the underlying theme here is that he doesn't argue with God's will. He doesn't argue with the messenger. That's what angel means there. It's a messenger that doesn't give him perfect instructions. Just go south. Can you do that? No, we can't. Because our tent pegs are in too deep. I told you this already, but it's the first sermon I ever heard that opened my eyes. Because if your tent pegs are in, and like, what do you mean, Lord? I already camped out here. I put some tent pegs in because revival was breaking out. And this guy was listening to me and that guy. And the sorcerer asked me to pray for him. And my tent pegs are in so deep. I ain't going anywhere, Lord. That can't be you. Must be an angel from the devil. Must be not. It can't be God. Well, God wants you to stay dependent upon him. And what happens when you camp out and you put your tent pegs in too deep? You begin to be dependent upon the things around you, the people around you. Go to the desert. Boy, that's a lonely place, isn't it? You ever been alone? Most people sit in a full room and they're alone. But you don't have to be. You choose to be. You don't have to be. You're choosing to be. You're part of a body who loves you. You're part of a kingdom that's coming. But the greatest thing is, is that when he goes and he trusts God, God shows up, even in the desert. And the greatest thing is, is that his heart is being trained to depend upon God and not depend upon man. See, we want to depend upon who we can see. Instead of live by faith and follow the one we can't see, but our hope is, is that we will see one day. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And right now he wants to speak to us through the ear portal, which is really our heart. It's really our heart. But he speaks that way. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He's training our hearts to be obedient to his authority because it's his reign, it's his rule, it's his kingdom, it's his planet, it's his salvation. And he's the one that wrote the plan. He's the one that's the author of eternal salvation, the, the, the beginner, the finisher, the alpha and the omega. But we listen to men. We listen to other plans. We listen to other programs. We follow traditions. That's the manner of men, we were told in 
2 Samuel chapter 7, as David wanted to build God a house. And God said, no, David, you can't build me a house. He said, but I'll build you a house. See, the manner of man is for us to want to build something for God. Instead of surrender and let God give us his salvation, to give us his grace, to give us all the riches of his kingdom. We have such pride that we want to build something, Lord. Got my hands all over your bride. Instead of surrendering and letting God build the house. Because he already said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. I will build my house. The one who builds all things is Christ. So the hard part is for us to get our hands off of and get our hearts moving toward just obeying the next thing that he tells us to do. And listen, you already know the precious promises of what he's going to do. You already know the blessing. But are we doing what he's already told us to do? And then looking in our hearts for the next thing to be obedient to. Are we in the word, prayer, and fellowship? Are we looking to see what our gifts and talents and abilities are? This, this is a, it's a broken record. I'm not going to say anything new because I don't want people to be drawn to me. So they have to get into the scriptures and have ears to hear and understand what Christ is saying and then come to him and take his yoke and learn from him. That's the only way to do it. And the only way to ever build a church is to let him do it. But if we keep teaching the scriptures and people say, oh, wow, that was really eloquent and they're a good order and they had a great sermon and I got real excited, but I never came to the throne room. I never learned that the answer is in this book and the teacher is the Holy Spirit and it's a relationship with a loving God who loves me individually. Then you miss the mark. You miss the obedience. You miss the plan. You missed the restoring of the relationship that once was in the garden that was interrupted by disobedience and sin and by the devil. Because that's the whole plan, is to bring us back into heaven with a heart that's looking to, not perfectly doing, but looking to be obedient in everything you know to be true and the next right thing, the next thing he asks you to do. And when you get that heart going, that's how when we see him face to face, he can justify saying, when you see me, I'll make you just like me. Because you're already moving in that direction. So why take the rest of eternity? Now he can just do it. And then he didn't have robots. He had people that has their hearts turned toward obedience because of the work of the Spirit. Because he first loved us. We should ask him to help us do that. So, no argument. What does he say? Go. Go. Arise and go. He must have been sitting down, huh? Wasn't getting on no plane. Must have been sitting down. Yeah, comfortable. Ten pegs in. Get up and go. It's the command that Christ gave us. Toward the south, along the road. See, I could preach on this one verse for the rest of the week. Goes down to Jerusalem. Jerusalem means teaching peace. To Gaza, which means strong, means strong. And so it's one of the few words that means the same thing in Hebrew and Greek. It means strong in both of them. They're still fighting over it. This is desert. Not dessert. Desert. You notice how we, when we do something and we get really good and we have a good meal and we think everything's going good, now we want to sit down and get some dessert. I'm sorry, I'm just making fun. So you remember, this is desert. God will call you into dry places, to alone places, so that you will depend upon him. I tell this story all the time. I might have already told it this week or last week. I, if you get tired of my stories, try to remember the principle behind them that I'm trying to get across. Uh, first year of my marriage, I don't know if I've told you my marriage, uh, first year was bad, second year was worse. So, Because we were uh, heathens that didn't know the gospel and weren't growing in Christ, and then we began to grow. And God is faithful. 21 years now, he's been faithful. Listen, I come home from work, thought I was the man, and I was going to work and coming home, and she was going to fry it up in the pan, and it was all good. And I come home thinking I just worked my butt off, and she said, one of us is leaving. I'm like, what do you mean one of us is leaving? She said, I can't go on like this. And I'm like, when I left this morning, it was good. 
She was like, no, I'm still dealing with that thing three weeks ago. Because that's what women do. I'm not being mean about a woman. I'm just saying they're built that way. Us men, five minutes later, we done forgot about that and we moved on. Didn't I say I was sorry? You said okay and okay. But no, it's still an issue, huh? <clears throat> so I got up and went to my pastor's house crying. Desert, alone. What do you mean? I'm trying to live for Jesus. I'm banging on his door, sobbing like a newborn convert should sob. Nobody answers. All of a sudden, tumbleweeds are blowing by. It's the desert. I sit down on a pew on his front porch and just cry out to God with all of my heart. And I told you, he's upstairs with his son Josh watching the Three Stooges. But he couldn't hear me in the back room of his upstairs house. But God didn't want him to hear me. God wanted to get me alone in the desert so that I would learn to depend upon God and not man. Man will fail you. That's why you have to come boldly. The veil was rent so you can come into the throne room. You can come into the presence of God. You can get on your face. He already knows anyway. And cry out for help in time of need. And he'll paint his grace and mercy upon you. If we learn to depend upon tradition or clothing or some man or some system, we'll end up in hell. But when you learn to depend upon the finishing work of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God as He washes and cleanses you, and you keep coming to God, no matter where you're at, He's going to keep completing you. And you're going to know you can trust in Him. And then you're going to learn to be that same way to other people. So you learn to become like Christ. You learn to be faithful even when the person leading you is not faithful. You learn to give mercy even when the person leading you doesn't give mercy. Because you're becoming God-like and Christ-like. And it doesn't matter who they are. What matters is your faithfulness and your next step of obedience. What matters is, has God called you? And are you saved? Are you doing what you're called to do? But you know what the devil does? And when you watch men, what happens is you begin to compare yourself to them. You begin to pick on them. You begin to sell yourself short of the work of the Holy Spirit because now all you're trying to do is be like man. All you're trying to do is reach to where they're reaching and you'll never get there. You want to reach to heaven. You want to reach to Almighty God. Philip goes because he's learning that when God says go, look what he's going to do. He's going to bring a bountiful blessing of fruit. And he's going to complete the work he started in you. Philip was an evangelist too. I really like this guy because I'm an evangelist at heart. I'm an evangelist at heart. So he goes toward, he doesn't have any specific directions. He's like, okay, wherever I go, I'm going. And wherever I go, there I am. And wherever I'm at, there God is. And I don't need anybody else, just God. Me and him is a majority. Do you feel that way in your walk with God? Because he wants you to. That's how John is the, the, the disciple that God loved. He knew when he was with God, with Christ, that, that God loved him so much. He knew that intimacy in the desert you might be in the desert right now cry out to God cry out to God he'll pour water on it he'll bring fruit in the desert he just did it to the entire nation of Israel used to be a desert now they're the foremost authority on exporting flowers he brings water in the desert in dry arid places he pours out his spirit and he produces fruit. He brings life from death. We got to get this. This is not some game. This is not another book. It's not a story. It's the testimony of the living God. And what he's doing with his people, his creation, restoring them to righteousness and wholeness and completeness with a hope and a future. Now, I'm not trying to cheerlead you into just grunting harder. I'm wanting you to see... That if you get in the word and you come to his throne and you cry out to him, he's a God who hears. All other gods don't hear. They can't hear. They're dead. They're fake. They're false. This God hears and he answers from heaven. This God not only answers, he came down and died for us. This God not only came down and died for us, but he ripped the veil so you can come up to him. 
And he's made his home in your heart, if you believe in him. He's made his home in your heart. And he just wants you to come and trust him. You can't trust men. How many people have been betrayed? Don't raise your hands. How many times is a good question. How many times over and over that God has never betrayed you? God will never forsake you. God will never leave you. You can trust him. You can trust him. You can't trust man, so stop doing it. Stop trusting in their systems. Stop looking to them for your answers. Stop crying out to them before you cry out to God. Cry out to God first, and if he sends you someplace to a man, they can help lead you. They can comfort you. They can pray for you. They can intercede for you. But if you go to man first, you'll never go to God. If you don't learn that you can be alone and be with God and it's okay because he already knew anyway. I'm sorry, I'll preach this forever. Good stuff. And now we got to get it into the heart where we do it. Look at this, verse 27. So he arose. Arise and go. So he arose and went. Right there. That's every bit of it. He heard and he obeyed. Christ heard, he obeyed. He got up from the throne room and came down and got us. One soul. If he was the only one, he did it. He did it. That's how great this gospel is. No matter what else is going on, he'll leave the rest to go get the one. But the main thing he did was not knowing. Christ knew. Philip doesn't know. He's just going because he's learning to obey. Types are all over in the Bible. And the men don't know, but they do know if they obey, God will do it. Christ knew what he did. Christ knew he was coming to die. Christ knew where he was going, and he did it obediently, even though he knew what was going to happen. See, the opposite is right for you and I. If we know what's going to happen, we're going to go sit back down. That's why when God gives us too much detail, we're like, oh, no, I'm going to burst and just sit back down. So he just tells him to go toward there. Just be obedient. Just go toward God. Just go toward teaching peace. Just move toward that. Even if it's a desert. See, because he knew it was desert. He's like, oh my goodness. He wants me to go down there in that desert again. But he's teaching him to trust in him that he knows what he's doing. Could you, I mean, you could do a whole conference on that one verse. Or, or teaching series. This is the first of the 20, 25 part. It'll be available for you for uh, one low cost of 27. So he arose and went, and behold, uh, behold, what, what? Somebody's there? It's desert. Why is somebody there? <laughs> behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. Now listen to me. This is the sad part. Because this is what happens when a person, you know, I remember my pastor telling me he was like, like dying. He wanted Jesus. He had to come to God. And he came to the church and they turned him away because he had the wrong clothes on. Why do I tell you that? Because this eunuch would not be allowed to worship in Jerusalem. He was a eunuch. He would not, according to law, he wouldn't be able to come in the temple at all because he was unclean. Not just because he wasn't a Jew, but because he had been castrated. So anybody, you, you couldn't come into the kingdom of God. See, and that's the way the curse makes you feel. That's the way the devil wants you to think. I can't go in there. I'm not dressed right. I can't get in. And man will tell you that. But God says, come boldly. God says, come to me, all you weary and heavy laden. Come to me, all you eunuchs. Come to me. You have curses upon you, and you feel like no one loves you. And I will give you rest. This eunuch was probably, even though he had the treasury of all of Ethiopia, and he had, he had scrolls. Do you get that? It's not like today where everybody's got ten Bibles. He had a scroll. Only the rich could have scrolls. You couldn't afford to get papyrus paper with the scrolls written on them. This guy's reading one. 
Must, his, his, his Candace must have really liked him because he spent some money to get this. And he's driving along reading it. Now maybe he just got one page because it was pretty expensive to get them. But listen to me. While he was turned away probably in Jerusalem, he might have been on another business coming by Jerusalem and thought, you know what? I'm, I, I believe in this God. These Jewish people, every time I meet them, they know God. I need to find out who their God is. We don't know. Speculating a little. But here he comes. He's reading the scroll. Probably turned away even though he went to worship and wanted. He doesn't know who to worship. He doesn't know who their God is. Neither did they in Jerusalem. Not the temple anyway. Isn't it interesting that probably. Hey, this is just interesting. That probably. This is just interesting. That probably. Think about it. There's thousands of Christians in Jerusalem. Many of them now have went undercover and ran off the other way, but all the disciples are there. He just come from Jerusalem and nobody told him about Jesus. The Jews, they don't believe in Jesus. The, the disciples, the persecutions broke out. They, they, they're afraid they're going to get killed. Silence the voice. Here he comes through Jerusalem. And it takes Philip being obedient to meet him on a road in Gaza, which he had no idea what's going on. I'm just going to go to the desert because God said go to the desert for one soul. For one soul who came looking to worship and wasn't allowed to worship because of the condition of his physical body. Now you might say I'm reading into that a little bit, but that was the law. And so I would say they're really good at keeping the law, but not very good at grace of God. And so, Philip obeyed, and here comes what the Holy Spirit has prepared for him, the eunuch, um, driving by. He was returning, it says in verse 28. He's in his chariot, and I don't know if they're carrying it, if there's horses pulling it. And he was reading Isaiah the prophet. I like that. Isaiah means, listen, Jehovah has saved Done deal. He's reading Isaiah. It means Jehovah has saved. And where he's reading at in chapter 53, which was your homework last week. Hope you read it. You should read it maybe every week. It's an amazing testimony of Christ. He's reading it and doesn't know who it is. He doesn't know who they're talking about. Sitting in his chair and reading Isaiah the prophet. Jehovah has saved. Notice this. This is a good point that somebody ought to make. He was someplace worshiping, and it impacted him so much that when he left, he wanted to know more, and he's reading. When you leave church, are you wanting to go be obedient and read your Bible? Are you wanting to see that there's more in this book because it's spiritually discerned and draw closer to God? Are you wanting to find out what it means and what he's saying and who it is and how it works and, and, and what God is doing in you and for you and through you? Does it give you that desire? Because this Ethiopian eunuch who didn't know Jesus is searching. He goes to Jerusalem and doesn't get a worship. But as he's leaving, he's like, I'm still reading. This is alive and active. I want to know what's going on here. And God sends every time. If you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. When there's one soul, he'll send a witness. If that witness is searching for God with his whole heart. I think it's an amazing uh, testimony. You guys, if I say story, it's okay to say, oh, pastor, stop that. Because it's a testimony. And we have to remember it's a testimony. And we've been calling them stories for years. And we need to say it's a testimony. Because it's the testimony of the work of the Holy Spirit through normal sinners. So I'd like for you to just interrupt me if I say story. Because I don't want to say it anymore. Because it's not a story. This is not a movie from Hollywood. This is not a book off the shelf that anybody can write. This is written by the Holy Spirit. And he's given testimony of things that happen so that you and I can have them as examples of what we should do and not do. And who God is and will always be because he's unchanging. A eunuch. What happens next, Greg? Well, I'm glad you asked. Verse 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, 
Notice the first time it was an angel, got him moving, and now the spirit is speaking. And the spirit does speak all the time. If you are looking to be obedient in your heart to the next thing that God wants to do, and you're looking to do his will, to see souls saved, because you're looking to be conformed in the image of Christ, you will hear the voice of the spirit. It might not be audible. He uses your intellect to speak to you. But he is down in the middle of your heart trying to pull out deep waters and counsel you and move you to obedience and conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. And he's longing for you to be obedient. That's what he died for. Christ did. Then he sent the Holy Spirit. Spirit of truth. Jesus is truth. The Spirit said to Philip, notice he spoke, and he gives him direction. He went, he was obedient, he went to this road south, and now he gets more directions. He sees somebody. Oh, there's somebody. Now I'm not alone anymore. Go near and overtake the chariot. No, I'm not going near, I'm not, I'm not going near that chariot. A lot of dust blowing around. I'm thirsty. There's lots of excuses, but notice again, the next step, he's obedient. He's waiting, he's willing, he's ready to be used by God. Go near and overtake the chariot, the Spirit says. And guess, guess what? He didn't just be obedient, he didn't just go. Look what it says. So Philip means fond of horses. I like that. My wife's fond of horses. So Philip, I'm not. So Philip, I'm teasing, ran to him. Do you see how, how willing he was to tell somebody about Jesus, to do the work of God, to be obedient to God? He ran to him, and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And then he asked him a question. Do you understand what you're reading? Now listen, this guy is reading out loud. Do you ever read out loud so you can comprehend what you're reading? Sometimes my mind is moving so much I have to read out loud. I don't know if you guys do that. But maybe it was all the commotion of the trail and the dust. And he's reading out loud. He's like, I want to know who this is. So he's reading out loud so he can hear the words bounce around. And you get a better comprehension sometimes. Listen, whatever you need to do. Sometimes when I read, I start to fall asleep. So I get up and walk and read. And patient read. You wonder if I'm ever going to fall on this stage. Sometime I probably will. I probably will. But I pace and read sometimes so I don't fall asleep because the word is that important. And this eunuch is reading out loud so that he can figure, he's trying to figure it out. But notice this, again, the obedience, the running. Ephesians 5.15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, redeeming the time, not as fools but as wise, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Listen, redeeming means make the most of the time. Philip ran with an urgency over this one soul, over the work of God. He went with an urgency. He was redeeming the time, he was obeying, and he ran. When's the last time you ran to somebody to tell them about Jesus? Do we understand that the whole work that we're doing is for the saving of souls? The work that we're doing is not to amass a bunch of earthly treasures. The work that we're doing is for the saving of souls. And I know sometimes this can be a really heavy message. But the most important thing is the saving of a soul. If it were not the most important thing, God would not have gave his most prized possession, his only begotten son, to save souls. And we all can say, oh man, I could run a little bit more. I could talk a little bit more. I could read a little bit more. Right answer. So then is that your next step of obedience? Is that the next place to go to the throne room and say, Lord, make me more concerned about souls? Help me to be more concerned about the work of your spirit. That, that I would stop being sucked into this world because it's not a playground. It's a battlefield for souls. And Christ has already paid for all of them. And all they need to, to do is hear. And how will they hear unless there's a caruso that would herald good news? How will they hear unless somebody tells them? 
How beautiful are the feet of one who preaches the gospel? That's what we're called to do. That's what Christ came to do. And that's what he wants to complete in us as he makes us just like him. And we take our next step of obedience by the power of the Holy Spirit for the work of the Holy Spirit for the perfecting of the saint. So we can finish the race and hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So he runs to him and he heard him reading. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He drew near in the word of God and he, it, it, the prophet Isaiah, and said, do you understand what you're reading? Now listen, in the King James it says, and he said, how can I unless a man guides me? Anybody get the King James say amen? Is that what it says? Amen. Mine says, unless someone guides me. And he asked Philip, see here's a guy looking. Here's a guy looking to know what it says. Somebody out of nowhere is out in the middle of the desert. And he's like, oh, I got a clue. Stop a carriage here for a minute. Come up here with me, Philip. He didn't know his name. Come up here with me. See, when somebody's sharing the gospel, do you listen to them? Are you looking to get answers? See, that's what this is for today. Sunday service or a Bible study or something like this is for the equipping of the saint for the work of the ministry. What's the work of the ministry? It's the ministry of reconciliation to save souls. There's no other work. See, we get lost in the tradition of church. We get lost in the ministry. We get lost in the repair and the building and everything that's going on. And we forget that it's for the saving of a soul. None of the dust means anything unless we're looking to be obedient to God and let the Holy Spirit prepare hearts so that their souls can be saved. Just because they enter into the work you're doing, just because they start coming to church, just because they're sitting next to you does not mean they're saved. Not all who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven will. It's, it's that simple. That should shake us to the core. If we're chasing the world and living for the world and our next step of obedience is not to be concerned about souls and first our soul and then somebody else's soul, if that's not what's going on in our heart, then there's something wrong with our salvation. There's something wrong with our gospel. There's something wrong with our ears because we're not hearing what the Spirit says to the church today. I know that's a hard message to go get that pill down. But it's an easy one. If we come and take his yoke, he gives us rest. It's, if we come to learn from him, it's very easy. No matter what the persecution and the pain and the suffering, no matter the desert, no matter what's going on, it's a very easy pill to swallow because it's his work. It's his kingdom. It's his glory. All we need to do is come and ask him to make us obedient. The rest of that verse. What's the rest of that verse? See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, it says no to his authority, but as wise who come to him, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I'm going to go there. I know the verse. I'm just not getting it in my brain right now. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Oh, be always be being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Listen, he goes on and tells you how to do it. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Speak to one another. Get involved in the work. Come under his authority and his will. That's what salvation is about. Yet we run about saying we know Jesus and I'm his child, yet we're under the authority of the wicked one. We're in bondage to whatever we're doing. It's an idol in our life. Now, I'm not telling you not to go to work because some people will say, okay, well, then I'm going to go live in a monastery and serve Jesus. No, Philip is out and about. But Philip wasn't afraid to leave a prosperous area of salvation with revival going on to go out into the desert to just get one soul because he was listening to the command of God, the word of God. The first thing that person who's looking for God does is read. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And it's not a man that guides. 
Look what he says. How can I unless someone or a man guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and set with him. When's the last time you sat with somebody over the gospel? We do it every Friday night. When's the last time you sat with somebody in their living room with a cup of coffee talking to them, reasoning in the scriptures to help them? But listen, I'm not being mean here. That's what Christians do. And if we're not there, then we should be looking for the next step of obedience so we can be there. And if you think you don't know enough, that person who's unsaved is still blind. And you were once blind, but now you can see. So you know more than they know. But it's a heart toward being obedient. It's a heart toward seeing the ministry of souls. It's a heart toward doing the kingdom of God and the will of God. And that's what the Spirit does when you let the Spirit do it. He guides you. And that's the point that's made here. Is that it's the Holy Spirit that guides, not man. Now the Holy Spirit will use obedient vessels to do the work. But it has to be a work of the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26. John is backward. Look at John 14, 26. Jesus speaking to his voice before he leaves. But the helper, you need some help? The Holy Spirit, you need some counsel? Whom the Father will send in my name. Now what's that mean? His name is his character, his nature, his will. It's his authority. It's his honor. He will teach you all things. Somebody get a calculator. How much is all? Type that in. All things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I live with, leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. We're looking for the world for peace? Not as the world gives. Listen, he wants to give us rest. He wants to give us peace. And then we can come to the throne. We can learn to be obedient. We can learn to be like Christ if we listen. But it's the Holy Spirit that does the work through obedient vessels. And we should look to be obedient to do the work of God. has to be done by the Spirit of God, though. Even Philip is being led by the Spirit. The Spirit told him, go near and overtake the chariot. Oh, that's pretty cool, isn't it? No wonder he ran. The chariot was probably moving a little faster. And he took off running. Reminds me of Elijah running, outrunning the horsemen. How can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. Listen to me. Make time to sit with people. Run to meet with them. <clears throat> Learn the scriptures. Ask the Holy Spirit to use you. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. But his purpose, he came. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? Who will tell somebody? For his life is taken from the earth. He died. He was in the grave three days. He was raised up. So the eunuch answered Philip. How, look how he answers him. The eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you. Do you understand what you're saying? I ask you. Give people a chance to ask the question. <laughs> of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or of some other man? See, if he'd been to Jerusalem, the Jews still worshiping in the temple, they didn't know. They didn't believe in Christ. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. They didn't. They, th they, went, they didn't know who it was. They missed it. It wasn't revealed. It was still a mystery to him. But Philip, who is being obedient, he knows. Can you imagine? Don't you like that? Listen to me. I'm just, gonna, just, just off the cuff here. Listen to me. Whatever field you're in, think about it. And somebody comes. Like, I love it when somebody asks me about carpet. I'm cleaning carpet. And they go, how can you get that out? <laughs> you know what? Shell answer man here. 
And you can feel comfortable talking about it because you know your business. Maybe it's metal fab, whatever it is. Maybe you're a secretary, whatever you are. Maybe you're a computer geek. And you, they ask you. And now you're in a place where you know what you're saying and you know how to answer. You know how to give them an answer. But what about if you're in the ministry of reconciliation of souls and somebody says, who's that talking about in Isaiah 53? That was led like a lamb to slaughter. Can you give him an answer to the hope that was, is within you? Philip is living it. Philip is running from the persecution. Philip is seeing the work of God in revival. Philip is obeying the Holy Spirit, and he's right there ready to open his mouth. The word is hidden in his heart. The truth is in his heart, just like the truth would be for our secular jobs or for what we know well. Who's going to play in the final four? And we tell them, I don't know. So I think Virginia is one of them. Anybody know? Uh, don't answer that. That's a trick question to see what you've been doing this weekend. That's a trick question. I got you. I got you. No, it's okay. It's all right. There's, they, they need to be saved too. Real bad. But listen to me. See, how we're ready to answer something we know, but we avoid that what we don't know. But we should be knowing the truth all the more every day because we're looking to be obedient to God. And the only thing that he saves within the ministry of reconciliation is when truth is proclaimed and they hear and then faith can come. And they can begin to believe the same thing that we believe. They're not going to get saved because we talk to them about basketball. Now, you might go to a basketball game and sit down in a seat next to somebody that needs to get saved, but you're really sitting down there because of the ministry of reconciliation. You're really obeying the Holy Spirit, and that's what Philip was doing. He didn't go to a desert just to be going to a desert thinking, I'm going to watch some tumbleweeds and see which one blows the fastest. He went because he was being obedient to God. And no matter what God asks you to do, there's always going to be blessing. There's always going to be fruit. And God is always going to go in front of you and prepare the way. The same way he did to the cross. The same way he did to crucifixion. The same way he did to heaven. And that's where we want to be. He's done it all before us. He's our forerunner. He's the author and the finisher. You can trust him to be there when you show up. No matter where you go. Because it's just normal life. It's called evangelism. It's called being an evangelist in some cases, but it's called being a witness in others. And you're all called to be witnesses for Christ. So the eunuch asked him a question. And what's it say in verse 35? Philip opened his mouth and the spirit filled it. And beginning at this scripture, he began in the scriptures of Isaiah 53, he preached Jesus to him. That's the word, that's not the word caruso, which is used in Romans 10. That's, this is the word uh, that's uh, acquainted with uh, uh, euangelium, which is the gospel, but this is euangelize, which means to evangelize. It means to give the good news in the purpose of saving souls. That's what you do. You preach to the unsaved, and then you teach the saved to equip them to go out and share the gospel and to be led by the Holy Spirit and in their respective places be ready to give an answer to the hope that is within them. Problem? My people perish for lack of knowledge. Problem? We don't know the word of God. Problem? We're not preparing ourselves to answer. So our kids are being trained in schools that are giving them an answer which is a lie. People are going to hell because they're listening to lies. And you and I, hey, we got, we're saved. I said a prayer. Don't mess with me, man. Don't judge me. I'm good. <coughs> really? What if that's a lie? What if that's some new gospel that wasn't preached? I don't see anybody in the scriptures going, I said a prayer. I'm going to sit here and enjoy the camels. I'm not being mean. We've been bought by the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus. We've been washed. We've been cleansed. When we hear the gospel, it has to change our lives. 
or not, we can be lulled to sleep by the devil when we're not being obedient. If our heart isn't looking to be obedient, we go straight to sleep. If we were ever awake. Many have not front slid. I'm not trying to make... But you know, Paul says to test yourself. Examine yourself. Put yourself on trial to see if you are even in the faith. And that's a very good thing to do on this side of heaven. On this side of physical life. Rather than to get to the throne room and hear, I never knew you. Be away from me, you who practice lawlessness and wickedness. See, the practice of your heart is what God's looking for. Is it a practice? Is it a leaning toward? Are you desiring to look to do the next right thing and be obedient? To, to look to do the next will of God? What do you want me to do now, Lord? Just like this man Philip is doing. Even though there's great fun over here. He was called out into the desert to go and do the next thing God asked him to do. And he's training his heart, just like you would train a child. When you smack their hand and you say no, or when you just say no, that will hurt you. Whatever it is how you might discipline, you're not trying to beat the child into submission, although that would deliver their soul from hell and it would be better than them to go to hell. The point is, is that you're training their heart to move in a specific direction. And that's what God is doing when we come to him as little children. He's training our heart to move in what direction? Christ-likeness. What did Christ do? He was obedient to the point of death. And we're going to look just like that when we cross the finish line. So he's training our heart to choose obedience so then that it's justice when he makes us completed in heaven just like him. That's why it says, to all who obey the will of God. That's why it says, Christ do the things he suffered, learned obedience. And then he gives salvation to those who obey him. That's why he said, go and make disciples. Well, actually, he said, all authority. See, it's because it's about God's authority. It's been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And do what? Teach them to obey. I mean, we can't leave obedience out. It's a heart that needs to be obedient. Let's close up. So Philip opened his mouth. And you're like, I wish he'd shut his mouth. I heard enough today. <laughs> he opened his mouth. And notice that, I mean, you know what? This eunuch didn't shut him down. He wanted to hear more. He was hungry for the word of God. And beginning at the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself, Jesus said. He preached the Lord is salvation to him. Isaiah, they're reading the Lord saved, and he preached the Lord his salvation to him so he would know who it was. Answers it in the names. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you believe that this morning, what's the first step of obedience? See, Son of God is a messianic term for the Messiah, the provision of God for the sin nature that was coming. It's an Old Testament that the Son of God would come. And, and it's just an Old Testament name for it. And so we know what Philip was talking about. Probably relates to the whole story. But what happened then? They were baptized. See, there's a spiritual baptism where you cry, Abba, Father, and you're transported into the body of Christ, and the Spirit comes and seals you into the day of redemption. Once you hear that truth, it's Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. But then there's the physical baptism where you go down, and that's what they're going to do, by the way. They're going to go down and get in the water. If it was sprinkling, what would happen? They could stand at the bank and sprinkle. But they got into the water. But again, as I tell you all the time, that's not the point. The point is, is being identified with Christ. You be identified with what? Identified with obedient to God's will. You were disobedient. You were an enemy. Now you've come close and become a friend. Now you want to learn how to be obedient and come underneath the authority of God's will and begin to go, move forward in your life, becoming more like Christ. It's not costume jewelry. It's not culturality. It's not what we see in the world today. It's wanting a heart that is going to obey and become like Christ. So this guy instantly, what do I do next? Philip was saying, what next, Holy Spirit? Now, he gets saved and he's saying, what next? The eunuch hears it and receives it. He believes it. And he says, well, then baptize me. What hinders me? 
If you haven't been baptized, you should be saying, if I'm saved, that's my first step of what? Obedience, the underlying theme of this text. Obedience. Because we want our hearts to be trained to be obedient. And so what's it for? It's not for the people standing around, although it is a witness to them, but it's because it's like, since I supernaturally am crucified with Christ, I supernaturally resurrect with Christ, I go down into the water, a watery grave, and I raise up out of the grave in newness of life. And it shows people that what's God doing on the inside, I'm going to be a witness on the outside. Listen, it's all about the heart. And we can't miss that. Everything's about the heart. Even in Romans 10, 9, and 10, and I know you guys are like, man, what's he shut up? He opened his mouth, didn't he? <laughs> Listen, Romans 10, 9, and 10, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Marriage ceremony. Listen to this. Listen, it's all about the heart. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can't confess unless your heart is full of him. You can't confess unless it's overflowing. He's opened his mouth and spoke. He, what comes out of your mouth is what you're being filled with. What you like to talk about. What you're interested in. What you ask a question about and long to give an answer for because you know it. Do you know him? That's eternal life that you might know God, the only true God and his son whom he sent. John 17, 3. Can you open your mouth and speak about Jesus. If not, don't be condemned. Say, that's the next step of obedience. Holy Spirit, teach me about Jesus. First step is, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Second step of obedience is baptism by water. Next step, between you and God, talk to Him. But you begin to... Be filled always with the Holy Spirit. Speaking to one another with songs and hymns and spiritual songs. You learn to be a witness. You learn to go out and enjoy and, and get involved in the ministry of reconciliation of souls. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. And he baptized him. It means to whelm him, overwhelm him. It's a total, total submersion. If you want to get into it, it's not a big deal. Because, uh, you know, if somebody couldn't get up and get into the water and they were laying in a bed, uh, uh, hospitalized or something, and they wanted to be baptized, I'd sprinkle them. Because it's a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of what you perform and how you go about following what man tells you to do. It's a matter of the heart of coming near to God and believing in His Son. It's just a first step of obedience. Now, when they came up out of the water, notice twice by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let a matter be established. They went down into the water and they came up out of the water. The spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. He went on his way rejoicing. Now, listen, caught away is the word harpazo. It's the same word used in 1 Thessalonians uh, 4.17, I think, to quote on that where it says... Um, Ooh, the Thessalonians were freaking out that their loved ones had died. And he said, I don't want you to be ignorant or unlearned, but the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we are alive and remain. We meet the Lord in the air and thus we'll be with him always. And, it, and it's the word caught up. It's the word harpazo. Um, and, and it means to be, here's what it means. Listen, to seize, to catch away, to take by force. It's 2 Thessalonians 4.17, by the way. It's the word used for the rapture of the church. It means to take for oneself. He purchased us. He bought us. You know, if, if you go to the store and you buy something that's sitting there on the counter, and, and, and now you're ready to take it home, if you pick it up and seize it and take it for yourself and go home with it, is that a bad thing? Are they going to meet you in the parking lot to arrest you? See, God's going to take us one day because he's bought us. And he wants our hearts to be learning to be obedient to him. And I think that's the evidence that comes forth when we're truly um, wanting to follow him. So it's the next, the next obedient step, learning to listen to the Holy Spirit. And it's amazing. You would think, listen, think about this. Shouldn't he stay and disciple that guy? Shouldn't Philip stay there and just go on to Ethiopia with him and just hang out for a few weeks and really just help him learn more about the things of God? 
Not if he's got the Bible. Not if he's got a scroll. Some of the greatest churches come out of Ethiopia. The great, you can go read about them, they say. I haven't read about them. I'm just listening to what some man said. Be careful with that, but I'm not talking about your salvation. I'm just saying the testimony of what happened with this eunuch. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God is what changes your life and prepares you to be the man or the woman of God. So as you leave, you might want to read the Word of God and learn this way more clearly. But Philip was found in Aztus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea, which is the capital Roman city of uh, the region of Judea. So now we see that the gospel has went from Jerusalem, then all Judea, and next it will go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Let's all stand. If you've said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and He's the Messiah, He's the provision for the sin nature, what is your next right step? What would you do next in drawing near? Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you in the Word of God. Get involved in the Word, Prayer, and Fellowship. And use your gifting, your supernatural unction, the first John tells us, to go out and be a part of winning souls to God. Father, we give you praise and glory, and we thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Thank you that you have awakened us. We pray that you would help us to walk circumspectly, redeeming the time, not to be as fools, but as wise. We ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us to be concerned enough to ask you what to do next. Thank you that we can come boldly to your throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Pour out your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The Lord bless you. You feel okay?